encounters with star people, an extraterrestrial, a spacecraft, and an Alaskan blizzard, Steve McCamley, Collective Spark reports. The topic of UFOs seems to be getting never-ending attention these days by the mainstream media, which is something quite different from decades-long ridicule campaign that's taken place. Recently, the New York Times covered a story about Eric W. Davis. He's a renowned astrophysicist who worked with the Pentagon UFO program, stating that he gave a classified briefing to a Defense Department agency as recently as March about retrievals from off-world vehicles not made on this Earth. Mainstream media coverage of UFO topics is a deep discussion, and it's a topic, like everything else, where the powerful interests, for lack of a better word, will no doubt try and control the narrative and shape our perception of the reality. And you can read more about this a little deeper in the article recently published about UFO coverage. All in all, at this point we know that's been denied for decades and that UFOs are real. The next question is now, what are they and who is manning them? Back when UFOs were still considered a conspiracy theory, there was ample evidence clearly showing that they were indeed real. It's a shame that something has to be acknowledged by mainstream for it to be considered real. And just as the evidence was there for the existence of UFOs when they were ridiculed, there is abundant evidence that civilizations have been visiting us for a very long time. Dr. Brian O'Leary, NASA astronaut, Princeton physics professor, says, that is to say, there is ample evidence, he says, in my opinion, suggesting that some of these UFOs are made by and operated by beings from other planets, civilizations, and other dimensions. And with this belief, I've dived into the lore of extraterrestrial encounters for quite some time. I find it fascinating how thousands of stories can corroborate with each other, and I find encounters with extraterrestrials, although they cannot be verified, to be a critical part for anybody to investigate if they want to have a broader perspective on the UFO phenomenon. Unfortunately, most people don't actually research the subject, and this often leads them to think that there is no real evidence and even report that to be the case. Please support my Patreon channel since YouTube has again demonetized my YouTube channel. My Patreon channel will have five different videos from my YouTube channel every day. Thank you so much for your support and that you find all my content so interesting. You'll find the Patreon account details in the description box below. At the very least, these stories, which number in the tens of thousands, if not millions, are very fascinating. Dr. R.D. Sixkiller Clark, a professor emeritus at Montana State University, who is Cherokee Choctaw, has been researching the star people and collecting encounters between them and Native Indians for many years. And in her book, Encounters with Star People, Untold Stories of American Indians, she te details many of the stories and explains how her fascination with star people came from stories told to her by her older relatives, like her grandmother when she was a child. The book is filled with many interesting encounters. In one of the chapters, she describes a story told to her by an Alaska native who apparently, quote, came upon an alien in the middle of the road during a blizzard. True to the Alaskan Code of Honor, he invited the alien to join him in his vehicle for fear he would freeze in the 70 degree below zero night cold. His name was Ross, and he had heard about Clark and how she collected stories about extraterrestrials and UFOs from Indian people. They met at a restaurant and Ross told Clark his story. Ross operated a snowplow for a living, and on the night of his encounter, he was working a 50-mile stretch during a terrible snowstorm where visibility was almost zero and the temperature with the wind chill hovering at nearly 70 below zero. In the book, Clark outlines a conversation between her and Ross. I left out most of what Clark asked and focused on key quotes from Ross describing the encounter. Ross says, my partner comes from the south we drive up and back over the st stretch of the highway, keeping the roads clear. Sometimes we drive 18-hour shifts, sometimes more. We usually meet each other around Lucky Gills. 
Clark says, I recognize a place, and he was talking that he was talking about. It was a halfway in consisting of a bar, restaurant, and gift shop. Ross, about an hour into the shift that night, I got a call from Bill, the other driver, that there was a strange glow up ahead of Lucky's Gill, Lucky Gills. He asked if I saw it. Before I had a chance to respond, I came upon a disc sitting in the middle of the highway. It covered the full two lanes. It was round with bright orange lights around the bottom. I stopped within 20 feet of it. I flipped up my lights up and down, and I tried calling Bill, but my radio was dead. Suddenly, blinding white lights came on, and the craft moved upward and was gone. I watched until it was out of sight, but that was not long because the storm cut the visibility that night to nearly zero. When it was gone, there was darkness all around me. I sat there for a moment. I could not believe what I'd just seen. It was at that moment I realized my engine was off. I never turn off my engine for fear it would not turn over again in the extreme temperatures, but it was off. I held my breath when I turned the key in the ignition, and fortunately the engine came to life for the, on the first try. I put, in, in gear, I put it in gear and began to move forward. Just as I got up a little speed, I felt a bump under my right tire as though I had run over something. That freaked me out. I thought it might be something from the spacecraft. I stopped the plow and readied myself to go out. As I tried to string, I tried the string of my parka under my chin, I saw a hand reaching upward and pound on the side window. Then a second hand appeared. It was the scariest damn thing I had ever seen, I swear to you. Those hands only had four digits. I turned on the light inside the cab and suddenly a face appeared and stared at me. Suddenly it turned and ran across the road to a stand of trees and disappeared. It ran across the road into the woods. I had no intention of following it. Leaving a vehicle in a blizzard could have deadly results. I thought that it was the end of it, but it wasn't. Suddenly the creature reappeared in the middle of the road ahead of me. Somehow I understood that it was cold and needed a place of shelter. I offered him to come inside my snowplow, but he wanted nothing to do with it. He stood in the middle of the road and told me he was cold and it was my fault. He said the vehicle took off without him. He was outside when I came upon the craft. In their haste to evacuate the scene, the other crew members left without him. I invited him inside the snowplow again. I told him I had to clear the roads and I could not leave him outside in the cold. Reluctantly, he came inside, but not like you and I would climb inside. He just appeared. One minute he was standing in the middle of the road, the next minute he was inside the cab with me. I would be lying to you if I said it didn't scare me. I was nervous and frightened. I just remembered that my grandfather taught me and stayed calm. That was the longest night of my life. I made it to my destination uneven, uneventfully. All the time the space travel was riding shotgun in the passenger seat. He paused and then a smile crossed his face. I think we must have made an unusual pair. Once I made it to the 50-mile point, I turned around and began the journey back again. It was snowing hard. The roads were covered with another four inches of snow. On the return trip, the spacecraft appeared again in the middle of the road at the exact same spot as I encountered it earlier. The star man suddenly disappeared. Within seconds, I saw him in front of the craft. The pulsating lights outside his uh, outlined his shape and in the dim light, I detected a brief and simple salute, or a wave, I'm not sure, directed towards me, and then he was gone. He just disappeared in the night along with the craft. He told me the craft had malfunctioned. They sat down in the middle of the road only momentarily for repairs. He was curious and had gone outside to do some testing of the snow. They didn't realize it was a highway because of the storm. Then I came upon them. When I came upon them, I appeared and shocked them, and in their confusion, they took off without him. They had not expected anyone to appear in the middle of the storm. To add to his dilemma, they were not allowed to make human contact, so he was uneasy about being discovered. So they immediately took off, leaving him behind. In the process, they violated several rules of their travel. He said they were a young crew and would likely lose their rights as explorers if their superiors discovered their mistake. He was fascinated with the snowplow and how it worked. He considered it a rather primitive machine, 
but one that he was curious about. He told me that humans put too much reliance on oil-based machines. He said they should spend their energy on studying the use of magnetic propulsion for travel. He could not understand why our scientists had gone in this direction. He had never experienced snow before or the extreme cold. He said on his planet, the weather never varied. He had never been so cold in his entire life and hoped never to repeat the experience. The alien was quite quiet most of the time. I was lost for words. I didn't know what to ask a man from the stars, so I was quiet too. After he was gone, I thought of a million questions. But when you're there and it's happening to you, it is different. He was small in stature. He had a human form, but he wasn't human. He could have passed for maybe a 10-year-old from a distance. His ability to appear and disappear fascinated me. I asked him about it, but he said that everyone from his world could come and go like that. He said I could do it too. I just had to learn to use my brain in the right way. I didn't understand what he meant. The day after this happened, a couple of military officers showed up at work and asked if anyone had reported strange lights or UFOs on the night of the storm. Of course, my boss told him there were no reports. I had not reported it either, and neither had Ed, the other driver. I thought it was best to keep quiet, so I never told them about the star man. When the military showed up, I played dumb too. I didn't want to lose work because of some government investigation. Besides, the military has too much control in the, in the state anyway. End quote. Now, it's fascinating to contemplate the implication of acknowledging that, quote, we are being visited and have been visited for many years by people from outer space, from other civilizations, end quote. Lord Admiral Hill Norton said, and I said it before, I'll say it again, the ET phenomenon, phenomenon truly leaves no aspect of humanity untouched and greatly expands human consciousness and the way we perceive ourselves, the cosmos, and the nature of reality. Just think of all that would change when we consider not only the existence of off-world civilization, but also the technology they used to get here. I feel human beings have been the potential, have the potential to create a human experience where everybody, including Mother Earth, can thrive. This is by um, Stephen McCallum, Collective Spark, and it's here uh, from Collective Evolution, published under Creative Commons. Please leave your comments and thank you for your support.